Hey guys, what's up? It's Mark from Moonlight Game Devs. Today I have another episode for you guys, this time with indie game legend uh, Jake Burkett, I think most famously known for his GDC talk, How to Survive an Indie Game Dev for 10 Years Without Landing a Hit. And uh, yeah, he came on the show to just share a lot of really fantastic information um, about his studio, how he kind of goes about developing games, and uh, yeah, I think you guys will really love it. Uh, please consider leaving a like or subscribing if you do it really helps out this channel and it just uh, motivates me and tells me that, that you know what I, the content I'm creating is, is helping you guys as well with that said enjoy the episode hey Jake welcome to the show thank you Mark it's, it's really cool to to see you um, kind of come on the show because when I started out um, in kind of game development I listened to your GDC talk oh yeah I think I think uh, a lot of people, um, know you through that talk, right? I mm -hmm. assume, like, when you go to events, people are like, "Oh, you're that guy from the talk, right?" Is that it's, kind of your experience? I would yeah, assume. Yeah, it is true. Actually, it's funny. It even happens years later because, I mean, well, I didn't go to any events last year, but the talk was 2016, and I bumped into people several years running from all around the world. You know, um, who would say, "Hey, you know, I saw your talk," and the, people felt they knew me because they watched the talk, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> and I'd never met them, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Um, yeah. I'm glad it, I'm glad it was popular and I think it brought a certain awareness to hopefully people wanting to get into this industry about the, the, the realistic side of it for indies, you know, because mm -hmm. often we hear the sort of super success stories and you, you need to hear what it's like for real, you know, I think. Yeah, and and, and my, my way is just one way how I made it work. Everybody's different, right? So and you, you've got to find your own path. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely leave a, a link to the talk in the show notes for anyone who's just kind of curious. But it's a really great talk about um, surviving in kind of as an indie developer for, you know, an extended period of time, even when you don't get that big, you know, hit uh, right away. Because for most people, that's that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but like... I think we already like skipped a bit ahead here. How about you, you for the people who don't you know, you just, um, just tell a little bit about yourself and kind of like how you got started in game development. Sure thing, of. Mark. Yeah, sure. So, um, okay. We're well, going back to the mists of time. Um, I learned to program in the eighties on a spectrum 48 K, which was popular in the UK and then a Commodore 64, then an Amiga. And I was always making bits of games as a hobby, but I never really shipped. I never finished anything and I never shipped a commercial game until I was 30, okay? So, you mm -hmm. know, I spent 20 odd years as a hobbyist. I spent nine years making business software before going full-time indie. Uh, so I've been full-time indie for almost 16 years now. And um, at first I made a bunch of casual downloadable games. And when people say casual games these days, they think of mobile. But before mobile, before Facebook, people were downloading uh, match three games and paying $20 for a match three game or solitaire game. And so I made a bunch of those and learned a lot about game design and making a quality finished product. And in more recent years, I've made things uh, like Regency Solitaire with my wife, Helen Carmichael. And that's done quite well on various platforms. Then we made Shadow Hand about a highway woman with turn-based combat solitaire. And then we made Ancient Enemy, uh, which came out last year, which is a sort of extension of the, the turn-based combat thing. And uh, I've also worked on a, a city builder, which is coming out later in the this year. Uh, and I've got yeah. more things in the pipeline. So, you know, but it's just, it was me for 10 years. Then it was myself and my wife. And that's it. That's it. That's us. And we hiring contractors and, and we run our business from home. Um, and, and so not so much has changed for us during the pandemic, which we're, we're very lucky um, about. Are both you, you and your wife um, kind of the, the company then? Or like, is your wife also working as a game developer the whole the, the whole time? Yeah, or? yeah. So because Regency Solitaire was her idea mm -hmm. and... Um, she said the idea to me one day and I was like, oh yeah, that could totally work. And then she did all the writing and the historical research for the characters and the backgrounds and the items. And then, you know, I put it all together in a game and then we discussed the game design and she designed the levels and tested the game. And so she's, yeah, basically th there throughout the whole process, but I'm sort of more on the technical side and, she, uh, and she's on the sort of creative side. And also we bounce business ideas off each other on game design. So She's a very important part of the company. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Um, like when you got started, I mean, 
a lot of things were really different. Like you already you mentioned there that, you know, the casual games scene was really different. People mm. were, you know, they're basically premium games nowadays. Um, you mentioned match free. That's like a lot of games that you made. These are like usually free these days. They've got yeah. like, um, I saw some of your match free games. They also have kind of like a, um, I don't know if you can call it a meta game, but like some kind of progression in there next mm -hmm. to the, the core gameplay. But um, there usually have like, waiting mechanics and things like that to to get people to pay eventually so they're very different to to back then like i'm assuming the technology was also different like what, what, what kind of tools were you using when you got started you know what uh, i mean yeah sure um well i'll give you a tiny bit of history because it's kind of relevant so i learned basic back in the day on the old 8-bit computers but it was never very powerful and then i learned assembly language for the Commodore 64 and amiga And that was great, very powerful control of the machine, but it also took a long time to actually get anything working on the screen and it was very error prone. And then I learned a language called Blitz Basic 2 and that was on the Amiga and it was like a basic language, but it, it ran as fast as machine code because it compiled into machine code. So, and I really loved that. Anyway, years later, I heard about Blitz for the PC. Okay, it was called Blitz Basic for the PC. And I was like, um, Okay, well, let's give this a go. I used to like it on Amiga. And I immediately really got into it. And that, that was when I wasn't even a full-time game dev. And I started coding a platform game in my spare time and learning the language. And then I realized, look, I want to quit my full-time job and do this, make games, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I used, uh, eventually I, I got onto a, a version of Blitz called Blitz Max, which is an object-oriented language that sits on top of C++ libraries. Uh, uses DirectX 9 and stuff like that. So it was fine. And I made a whole bunch of games of that. In fact, Ancient Enemy, which I shipped last year, was still made in Blitz Max. Um, you know, and I, so I used that tool for like more than a decade and it, it was totally fine on PCs. Um, it was fine on Macs for a while, but Apple keep changing their standards all the time. And eventually it, it became not suitable for Mac. So Ancient Enemy only shipped on PC. Um, mm. And again, it wasn't cross-platform, so there aren't mobile or console versions of that game. But it was really great for PC. I used that. I used Photoshop a lot to like edit artists' art or do bits of stuff myself. I did all the sound effects myself by using sites like freesound.org, getting sounds that were Creative Commons, editing them in sound blaster tool or, or audacity and stuff like that so um yeah so that's kind of what i've used and it's only the last year i've been moving over to unity and using that for the city builder and uh you know I've, i've gained a lot of experience because i was able to look at other people's code and learn from that and there's a huge amount of resources out there and so going forward any new games will actually be in unity probably i'm giving that a 99 <laughs> chance probably yeah. anyway i hope that answers the question Is that is that kind of because of that, that cross-platform portability and on, on top of that, all the other features that, you know, you, you get with Unity, but... Yeah, it, it's uh, several... Yeah, let me outline the reasons. So there is obviously cross-platform, though I don't want to touch mobile personally. Um, consoles mm -hmm. are potentially of interest, mostly the Switch, um, but I wouldn't really do... The ports myself what i'd prefer to have is the pc game up and running and then give it to an expert porter and say look just make this work on switch or playstation or whatever and when it's in unity that's easy to do yeah um when it's in another language it's not easy to do you know because th they have to do a whole load of uh, stuff and it possibly introduces problems um so this cross-platform the other is just literally i can ask on twitter for help and people go try this try that you know or i can look up resources online And could, but Blitz, when I used Blitz back in the day, I was on a forum and it was very helpful, really good people there who helped me um, learn the language and with all sorts of tricks and tactics. But obviously it's an older language now. And so that side of things is, is going away. But there's so many resources out for Unity. In fact, there's almost too many because you have to figure out, are you reading something 10 years old? Is it for the wrong version? You know, what's relevant now? Uh, and related to that, I also figure that if I ever needed to sort of hire someone to help with the game, it's way easier to find someone who can use Unity than Blitz Max. And like in the back of my mind, I don't want to have to do this, but there's this um, plan that, you know, worst case, if I really need some money, I can say, look, I'm available as a Unity contractor. Hire me. I've made games in it. You know, it's like my fallback position. Um, 
to do contract work in Unity. If that mm-hmm. failed, I'd have to get a job somewhere. But, you know, <laughs> um, that's not <laughs> my plan. It, yeah, yeah, it's like make my own games, be a contractor, get a job sort of thing. It totally makes sense. And, yeah, those are actually excellent um, excellent just points you outlined there. I think, like, Unity is just going to keep growing. I, mm. You know, people... Their earnings weren't great, but I think that, you know, they've just got such good software. It's so versatile. I think it's just going to go beyond gaming. So like contracting seems like a great mm, could way be. to diversify in that regard as well. I, think, I think, sorry, yeah. you can uh, uh, well, um, the other issue, I guess, with Unity is there are various people complain about changes and things that aren't complete and whatever, but for, for the mm. things I'm using it for, which is 2D games at the moment, it seems pretty good. I mean, I've run into trouble with the UI system and stuff, but yeah. It, it kind of seems uh, pretty good. And like you said, I, I forgot to mention the other advantage is the technical stuff. So um, if I wanted to add some new special effects or shaders or whatever onto my 2D games, I could do that because I quite like making particle effects in my old Blitz Max games. So that is an advantage that I can do extra stuff in Unity. Um, so I, sorry, sorry, I got distracted. I forgot to mention that point. That was all. No, it's... it's- Thanks for adding that because of, yeah, like Unity is just, it's a super versatile tool. You can like, really easily blend 3D and 2D kind of the text and mm. makes for some really like unique opportunities, which I can imagine like being re- something just being very challenging in, in like a self, primarily self kind of developed or self-organized kind of framework. Mm. Um, yeah, like um, you kind of touched there that you primarily do 2D games. And I also um, listened to an- another thing that I'll leave in the show notes and really recommend to listeners. Um, you did like a webinar called You're Taking Too Long to Do Your Game. I think oh, it's yeah. what it's called. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that, that, that was a great webinar. I think it's really informative. Like one thing I really liked about that is um, you kind of, you know, a lot of people when they give advice, they, they kind of give a, they know that one uh, decision is probably better than the other decision, but they uh, kind of, they blur it. They, they say, you know, consider this or that. But if I recall correctly, you just kind of said, like, if you're doing an indie game, you know, don't do 3D, <laughs> just do 2D because it saves so much time. Yeah. Like maybe you can go, go further into, like, those kind of things that you learn over time in, in terms of how can you really, like, improve your scheduling and, like, making sure your game is not too delayed because I think that's something that a lot of indie developers, especially new ones, just like struggle with a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a big topic, um, but I see if I can skim over some of them. So a lot of this I learned the hard way or other people told me stuff as well, right? And I've seen other people fail at stuff and I've gone, okay, I don't want to do that. So the first thing is scope. Um, my first game, indie game, was this, you know, multi-directional scrolling kung fu beat up platformer, which I never released because I realized it was just too big and it was going to take too long. So, um, you know, I aborted that and I made a much smaller game that I was able to finish and go, great, I finished. I now know the whole process. I can ship that game and improve upon that process. And it's, it's probably the single biggest mistake I see new indies doing is making a game that's too big. I'm, uh, you know, too big or even beyond their technical capabilities, but mostly it's just too big, like making an RPG or some online game or a 3D game. Um, so that's one thing. I avoid 3D just because generally, I mean, things might be changing with more modern tools, but generally, at least in the past, making any kind of 3D asset is just so much more work than 2D. There are exceptions, like if you're animating something in 3D, it's easier perhaps than hand drawing tons and tons of animated sprites, but um, 3D can be, you know, pretty damn expensive and take a lot of time and needs specialist uh, artists and specialist tools and stuff like that. So I've just avoided it personally. I know not every indie has, and some have had great success. Um, Though I'm interested in using 3D style effects in Unity, you know, like messing around with the camera angle and stuff like that. I think that's kind of interesting, but that's still within a 2D game. You can do parallax and stuff. So um, I avoid those kind of things. The other thing is um, I've reused my engine a lot of times, okay? So I made seven match three games, right? And some people are like, oh, my God, you know, some people would be like, you're just making shovelware. Uh, The thing is I actually like match three games. I like playing them. I got to understand the rule set and... Uh, I enjoyed making each game better. Like you, the latest games do have this meta game sitting around it where you decorate something and you, you know, the, the things you decorate have an effect upon the gameplay. 
So each one got better and I was able to reuse that engine. And then with Solitaire, I've reused the engine and improved it each time, several times, three times. And so a lot of indies don't want to reuse or even make the same game again because they're like, oh, I'm bored with that now. I need to go and do something else. I get that. But from a business point of view, reusing your technology, you imagine if Elon Musk made a bunch of Teslas and then went, you know what, I want to do bicycles now. Let's throw out all the factories. Let's get rid of them all. Mm. And it, it just doesn't make business sense. If you can reuse something, you should do that. Not just the technology or engine, but your your skill. You'll have learned a whole load of stuff about that new um, genre. And then you'll be able to go deeper into it and begin to innovate and do things no one did before which is what I did with my solitaire games. No one made turn-based solitaire, right, in, in the way I did that. Uh, and then I innovated with Ancient Enemy a further step, made it kind of a bit more like Slay the Spire in some ways. Um, and anyone else trying to do that will be playing catch-up because I've pushed ahead into that genre, I think, more than anyone else has. So I guess those are – my summary there is, you know, always watch your scope. Yeah, avoid 3D. You know, mm-hmm. avoid – really figure out – Okay, I'll go into the 3D one a bit more. It's not just 3D. It's avoid anything which will bloat your project. And certain mm-hmm. things will really bloat your project. Like we added a character in Shadowhand, which you could put costumes on, costume items. The problem is getting them all to fit and work with each other was really complex and took months of editing in Photoshop uh, to sort mm-hmm. it out. And it wasn't just one stance. It was every combat stance. So there were like five or six stances that all needed different clothing on. It took months and months. It's great. Now it's done. But it really bloated the project. And we uh, removed that from Ancient Enemy. And the project was done at least a year and a half, sort of sooner than than Shadowhand, wow. right? So you're half the time. Um, plus there's some reuse in there. So anyway, there's scope, including, you know, not bloating it with stuff. Um And then there's reusing stuff and getting better in your genre. So I guess those are some of the tips. I think, does that answer your question? Totally. I mean, I think all of those are are excellent tips. And there's also one thing that I wanted to touch on that I thought was really interesting. And, you know, personally, I find it really smart is like you you make different games, but they're kind of connected, presumably, because you're able to reuse um, a lot of the elements there that you already developed, like, um, and you, yeah, like you said, you just kind of ma- learn to master that specific genre and just improve upon what you already made. Um, if it works, it works, right? Like mm-hmm. with the solitaire games, for example, you didn't really need to reinvent the wheel. You could just use a game that's really solid, like sol- the solitaire. Yeah. Like it works, people enjoy it, and then you add an RPG mechanic. Uh, I mean, it seems like a really good idea. But yeah. also kind of safe, which I, I guess you need to be when you're an indie, right? Right. And that, that's why I did Match 3 originally. I was like, this is a safe genre. It works. And then I began to understand it and add my own innovations and twists and get into the themes, you know, enjoy the themes. And like some people talk about reskinning. Now, reskinning would just be changing the art assets and nothing else. But with something like Spooky Bonus, I was like, okay, well, I, I wrote down giant lists of all my horror influences, books, movies, whatever. And I wrote down all the kind of tropes I could think of. And I sort of data mine that for the best ideas to put into the game. And then the gameplay changes accordingly, like the power-ups are related to the horror objects and then the, the sort of overarching plot and a map. And so it all blends together. It's not just like a reskin. It's, it's a re-theme. It properly changes everything. And like when we did Regency Solitaire again, it was solitaire with this Regency theme, but it all blended together in terms of the story and the game design and everything else. The same with Shadowhand, right? So... Um, that's the kind of way I like to think about things and starting with something solid and adding your own take on it means that players who are familiar with one thing like the match or solitaire are like, okay, I'll give this a go and see if the twist is interesting. Whereas if you come up with something brand new, okay, on a very rare chance, you might get some massive success. Like somebody had to come up with match three in the first place, right? Right. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're you, you've got standard chance of players going. I don't know what this is, and not bothering to download it or try it. So it's mm-hmm. better to perhaps go with something they're familiar with. I think from a business point of view, anyway, creativity point of view, it's a different matter. But you've always got to overlap the fact that you're trying to run a business and survive with your creativity, and find some kind of compromise in the middle that that is working for you. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I find it really, really important to um, kind of have a game 
that people, when they look at it, they they understand it really quickly. I think that's mm-hmm. something that a lot of game developers say, and and we can kind of see it in certain innovations as well. Um, you know, mobile game developers often speak about like CPI. You know, making sure that people, when they look at the ad, they know what's going on, and that kind of translates as well to I think indie development. Um, where you maybe share a GIF on Reddit and you just need people to think like, wow, you know, this is cool. I know what this is. I'm, I'm, I'm like, check it out. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and you, you're, the way your game looks is your shop window, right? Yeah. It's what gets people in to pay more attention and hopefully buy it. And so trailers, again, you need to show the gameplay in the trailers. That's something Ryan Clark always goes on about um, it is trailers that show the gameplay and you know and i have seen some game trailers and i'm like i still don't know what this game is you know and and, uh, i do i am interested in theme but i'm most people are interested in what the genre and mechanics are you know do you want to play an fps or a racing game you know it it might be about a certain theme but the theme is adds to the appeal you know you you, you're out shopping for a platform or, or a fps you know I think what's important is to have a match between like the target audience of the genre you're making and the theme. If you know mm-hmm. if that makes yes. sense. Yeah, if you does. make a, um, I don't know, like a, a shooter, which takes place in like a shopping mall and people are shooting baguettes at each other or something like this or shopping mm. or some that might not appeal to like the hardcore shooter mm. audience that you might be kind of trying to get with that genre. Um, so I think like that, that it's really like you, you got to mix it, mix it, kind of match it. Um, same with the art style. Mm-hmm. So like, I agree with you that com- completely that your art style is, is like the first step of marketing. It needs to mm. just look good. And yeah. Well, um, I found this out a long time ago when my second match three game, I used pixel art. Hmm. And um, the problem at the time was the casual game audience didn't really like pixel art. They thought it was like, um, unsophisticated or whatever, right? And they were looking, and it just didn't go down very well. So my third game, I used 3D rendered shapes that animated and moved around and they just looked higher quality and people were willing to spend more money on a game that looks higher quality. It's just very simple, you know? Yeah, when yeah. something looks lower quality, they're like, eh. but these weren't indie gamers, these were casual gamers, right? So again, there's the audience. For an indie gamer, you might, you, you might want some kind of pixel art, but again, it can't look bad. It's got to be great pixel art with really good art direction. I think your your analogy, like your example from your real life, was so much better than the analogy I was trying to make because pixel art is such a classic example of like a where you can really it's like a hit or miss in terms of matching with what your target audience wants. Like, yeah, if you're doing like a top down shooter, like a lot of people who play those games, they love pixel art. That's why mm. a lot of the big, you know, top down shooters like roguelike shooters, they're pixel art, but you know, you don't see that many like mat- match-free pixel art, for example, because no. the target audience they they want to have like the cartoony Candy Crush type look. They want yeah. it like that. And people yeah. have said in the fall before to me, why don't you make a solitaire game with like this theme or that theme? And I'm like, because the audience I'm aiming for isn't interested in that theme. They're interested in the mechanics and like Regency worked really well with, uh, you know, this historical theme where they played, because Helen said to me in Regency times, they played cards a lot. Fortunes were won and lost back then. So adding that to a theme to a card game makes perfect sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but other themes are actually bad ideas because they wouldn't they wouldn't appeal to the casual market as a theme. And then if we put that game you know, on Steam, sometimes, I mean, the problem is the mechanics don't appeal to the Steam audience. I mean, and that is my problem a little bit with games like Ancient Enemy. They've got this cool RPG theme, which is better suited to Steam, but people on Steam, a lot of them are just like, oh, solitaire, mm, I'll give it a miss, you know. And if, if I just copied Slay the Spire and put the RPG theme on it, I think the game would have made more money. It's kind of depressing, mm-hmm. but but true, I think, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean. I mean, yeah, that's like, uh, yeah, I, there's nothing to add there. I think that's like a great analysis because, uh, yeah, I think um, there aren't that many solitaire gamers on Steam. It's mm. just a different audience, like you said. So it, it's theme has got to be suitable for your audience, but so have the mechanics, right? And there, are, we know that 
Steam, there's a lot of simulation and strategy games on there because you can play them with a mouse, but they're worse on console. So you obviously got to pick your platform. And that's one of the things about these cross-platform games people talk about in Unity is, can a game truly be cross-platform? So, only some genres, I think, can. Other ones really are not good at are terrible on mobile or on console with tiny fiddly text and using a joystick instead of a mouse. There's lots of problems going cross-platform. So you really do need to pick your primary target and hope to make your money back there. And anything else is bonus money if you can move into profit. And even that, that making your money back is very, very hard in the indie space. So, so like, how do you, how do you how do you go about that? Like, how where, where do you start? Do you start with the platform? I mean, for you, I think it's already you already said that it's like kind of a given. You want want to make PC games first, yeah. Then, then like, where do you go next? Do you start with a game mechanic or a, an audience? Like, how do you go about your kind of game idea evaluation process? I guess. Well, in the past, it has been games that I actually enjoy playing myself, mm -hmm. um, in terms of a genre. And with a mechanic that I thought I could program myself, that I understand and, you know, could program, right? So it has to be technically achievable and something you enjoy. If it's not something that you enjoy, there'll be no passion behind the yeah. project, right? And and you, players will tell. Players can tell when a game was made with no passion, right? Because it just shines through in, in all the wrong places, you know? So, um Yeah, it has to be, you have to be technically capable. And a small side point here, a lot of people sort of think, oh, match three is easy to program. And I've seen people try to program them and go badly wrong. And mm -hmm. again, my solitaire game maybe looks simple on the surface, but there are so many fine details and tweaks in there that make it seamless and smooth. It's not obvious to players in, until somebody tries to make it, right? So even simple genres may not be simple. Um, so I go about it like that, but then I think, yeah, okay, well, I was making games for the casual download portals and they only had a, a small subsection of viable genres. And if I, if I made a game outside of those genres, it just wouldn't sell no matter how good it was. So that was definitely considering the platform. Steam has got a bigger audience and a wider selection of genres. So you can try your luck in many different ones. But again, there's a lot, lot of analysis done online by people like Simon Carless and uh, Lars. Um, in, uh, so people are looking at the genres on Steam that in theory have sort of made the most money and that maybe there are, there are niches on Steam, but are they profitable niches or not and stuff like that. And that's why I worked on a city builder last year because I was like, well, this is a popular genre on Steam. It might be beginning to get crowded now, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and so the issue is how can you make a city builder that's unique and stands out? And that's a whole nother thing. It has to have some kind of hook or theme or something which makes people go, oh, yeah, I'm interested in that more than these other 10 generic city builders in some way. So it's a complex process. It's no easy thing. You know, you, um, you've got to want to make it. It's got to be viable for the platform and within your skill set and your budget. So, you know, I'm having to make games on a pretty small budget at the moment because I don't have a giant pot of money. You know, I mean, sometimes I manage to get funding for things, but it's never like big funding. It's funding just to help me make a fairly small game. But that helps me keep the scope down and actually ship the game in a reasonable time frame, um, which I enjoy. I mean, I've shipped 12 games, the 13th is coming soon this year and more on the way. So shipping is good. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, that's that's great to hear. Um, it's like speaking of of um, funding. I mean, you already said that you you do most stuff yourself, um, but like there are many kind of like um, funding opportunities, like getting getting investment from uh, getting a project funded to getting like a, a, starting a VC backed company. And these days, like that's come, becoming a little bit mm -hmm. more popular now with uh, games as a service, um, like. For you, what kind of um, is this something that you're actively looking to do when you're thinking about a game? Like, are you thinking about what kind of funding opportunities are there, and what are you looking for? Are you looking for maybe a, a, a publisher who's just going to kind of do some of the marketing for you or, or that stuff, or are you looking for someone who might like pay for a game, for example, and like have a profit split? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've done I've done a variety of different things. Um, And some are better than others for me personally, right? It all comes down to what people want to do. So one of the things I don't personally want to do is some kind of 
uh, investment into my company where they get a share of the company. Because I, when you've run something for as long as I have, 15, 16 years, I don't really want anyone else having a say or being able to tell me what to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like being my own boss. And so that's not really my thing. Though I know that people spin up separate sub companies for one particular game and they do investment into that. So that is a possibility. Mm. Um, I know somebody, somebody that's done that. And that, that limits my risk. It limits their risk in a way. You know, it's like a separate entity. So that's a possibility. Uh, the other thing I've done is I've had, the UK is very lucky. We have tax breaks for games. Okay. So for years, there were tax breaks for the movie industry. And a, a UK body managed to get tax breaks for games. What that means is when you spend your money in the UK or in Europe, um, that might change because of Brexit. Um, but luckily it's not changed at the moment. When you spend your money, you get a certain percent of that money back as a tax break. And that's been really good for us. That has meant we've been able to, when that tax break arrives, it's like Christmas, you know, this, this money arrives and we're like, woo. And then we reinvest it in the company and keep going. And I honestly think it's helped us keep going. And a lot of developers have said the same. So certainly people need to look into tax breaks in their own countries. Um, Canada's got some, you know, um, I've definitely, I think I've heard about ones in other European countries as well. So, uh, so that's one thing. Publisher, I have worked with somebody who published a game that was Cliff Harris from Positech Games. He published Shadowhand. So he, he paid for some shows. We went to some shows and we dressed up in costumes and had the stand and did all that kind of thing. It's very tiring. And he paid for advertising, um, both on websites and uh, Google ads and other ads. And, you know, so he was expert at advertising, which not a lot of indies are. So he did that kind of stuff. And he put all the games on the stores and had the right contacts for various things. So he did loads of stuff and it definitely made a difference. But obviously you give away a share for that. Um, the other thing I've had is funding, but not publishing. So some people sometimes put money in your company for a percentage of the profits, but they stay, they don't tell you what to do with the game. They don't do any of the marketing. They might help a bit, but it's not their main purpose. And that's quite good. I quite like that um, because we, we are actually quite good at doing our own marketing to a certain extent, I think, and we're getting better at it. Um, so, so that's one possibility. The other thing is uh, grants. You can actually get grants. We got a grant in the UK, which means literally free money. They don't want anything at the end except for mm -hmm. some paperwork. We had to do a lot of paperwork for a thing called Creative England, and we got a small amount of money to make Regency Solitaire. It wasn't for the whole cost, just some of it. And that was free money. And I mean, if you can get free money, wow, you know, take yeah. that. That's only happened to us once. Um, so it depends on your aims. The ideal situation personally is I've got enough money to make my own game so I don't have to spend time trying to find a deal because trying to get a deal, publishing deal, funding deal, whatever, takes time and effort and is disappointing when people say no. So if you can fund your own game, brilliant, you don't have to waste time. Then you keep all the profits yourself, right? Whereas mm -hmm. you have to give it away to somebody otherwise. So that's all really good. And you've got total control and I would actually prefer that. But that mm -hmm. assumes you've got enough money in the bank to do that. And I don't always have enough money in the bank to do that. And so I need to go out and make make deals and make deals with good people who are going to support me. And and, and, and uh, also, hopefully, you know, the game breaks even and they see a return. So everyone, everyone kind of wins, right? Yeah. So and lots of possibilities and I've done them all. Um, the only thing with, again, doing everything yourself is that if you could partner with someone who really is, an excellent marketer and could take your game to the next level, then that may still be worth doing. And also you might not want to risk your own money. You might want to take the money out and put it on your mortgage. And maybe people say, spend other people's money. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard that know. advice as well. Yeah, yeah. so who knows, right? I, yeah. I mean, sure. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a really, really great perspective into like the different funding opportunities, but also the different uh, drawbacks and, and benefits there. So mm. very cool. And uh, like when you, when you start a game project, like how do you, how do you allocate your funds? Do you kind of use contractors or buy assets or, you know, um, do you do like everything yourself? What's your kind of approach there? Um, okay. I've got a th thing. The thing about buying assets is I've never done that. Well, that's not true. I did for my first game ever. So okay. a long time ago, um, when 
I, I bought some stock assets from my first game, but it looked like a game cobbled together out of stock assets, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your problem. Like imagine you're making a game and you say, well, I've got this brilliant character I bought on the store and I've got some background art, but then you want to add a new area to the game and you don't have the right assets for that in that style. You might have them in a different style and then your game's going to look bad. Most professional quality games I know make their own assets. It's very unusual I think to mm -hmm. like, I think all the asset stores are really good for hobby programmers or people trying to put together a prototype. Or if you've got such an asset that you can give to a professional to change, to edit and then improve and make your style fine. Okay. That's my view on it. Perhaps I'm outdated. That said, there are assets like special effects and things. Okay, fine. Special effects are fine, but, but actual sprites, backgrounds, characters, you want to put, you want to do your own, uh, theme and design, right? So, so we, um, yeah, we definitely allocate a certain amount of the budget, quite a lot, to art, and that means hiring in external contractors. So we don't do any of the art ourselves; we hire it, them in. I do often mm -hmm. edit the art. I change bits of the UI around, or you know, tidy things up. So I might do extra stuff that it's just too much work to send back and forth. Um, so art is a big part of it. Music, we, in the past, we've worked with, for one ga uh, many games, one musician, and we've paid him um, sometimes money, sometimes money and royalties, both things. And so that was worth doing because I can't make professional quality music. I can make amateur music, but not professional. Sound effects, mostly I've done myself. I have hired a professional before for Shadowhand, and they did a great job um, because there were a lot of... Uh, voice over work and they recorded all of that which would have been difficult for me to do i think like i'm okay with standard sound effects but i think when it comes to voiceover you need you need a professional to be honest um and then we also hired for ancient enemy an external marketing person who helped us with a load of marketing um mm -hmm. stuff and that was worth doing and i hired a professional trailer maker who made me a great trailer right but again i worked with them i don't like to hand stuff just over I like to direct them. I'm probably an annoying client. You know, I like, hey, can you change this? Can you change that? But if you do it in the right way, I think it's okay. And the end result can be better because you know what you want. They, they've they got the skills and you you mesh together, right? So, yeah. um, so I, you know, I hire different people, but I'm doing the programming at the moment, game design, and my wife's doing research, game design, writing. So mm -hmm. we only need artists, musicians, marketing, basically externally and i do my own accounts to a certain level but i hire an accountant every year to do my annual accounts and send them off to the correct authorities right so right. but i do most of the day-to-day -day stuff myself um and I, I the only thing i haven't hired is a lawyer so i do look at all the contracts myself and i read them in detail and i attempt to understand them and i push back if things aren't aren't good uh, i know americans are big on hiring lawyers for everything right um but I've managed to do without one the whole time, which is pretty great, really. So, yeah, yeah. that's great. It's great that you didn't get sued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that too. Well, I'm careful what I do, right? But um, And I've never paid for a, a trademark or a copyright thing either. I've never paid for anything like that. Yeah. Perhaps if I was a bigger company, bigger game, I would need to be doing that, right? In case people try to rip me off, but right. maybe. Try to protect IP, Yeah, which is important for sure if you do... If you do get that hit, then yeah, uh, that can lead to a lot of more profits for sure. Yeah, like uh, I'd be curious to know um, how do you kind of you know when you contract a, a marketing um, person, like what kind of service do they offer, and how do you kind of measure the success of that? I mean, you could say you know the game sold well in the end, um, but that would be one way to measure the success of marketing, I guess. But other than that, you know, I think there's kind of like a challenge there as well. There is. Uh, you're, you're right. One thing to be careful of is when you begin to get close to launching or, or work on a game, you get a lot of emails from kind of, I won't call them scammy marketers, but like marketers who are basically going to do hardly anything for you that you couldn't do yourself and charge you a fee for it, right? And I think they prey on amateur indies who are like, oh my God, I've got to do this marketing thing. And they think, oh, if I pay this person a couple of hundred bucks, they'll do that for me and it will make instant success. And you know, that's not true. Um, but when you get to the point where we were already had a certain Twitter following, Facebook page, blog, Patreon, email list, you know, games on Steam already. We've got, a, 
we've already got an audience. Okay. And that's the thing a lot of indies don't have. If you're making your first game, you don't have that audience. So you, you may need somebody to help you find one. We've already got one and fans. So we were able to leverage all of that. But the, the marketing person we used last time, they had some specific streamers they were friends with who they were able to get play the game as an exclusive before it came out, which helped boost wish lists for our Steam game. And they were able to send out loads and loads of keys and contact press that perhaps we didn't have on our list. And even even because we have our own list and did all that stuff ourselves, but it's just handy having someone else do that with their own personal contacts. Um, yeah. And it, it worked. We, we saw wish lists go up when they engaged their process though we were doing our own stuff. So it's hard to separate who's doing what, right? Um, but we definitely saw a big boost in wish lists, and the game did have a good launch and we didn't pay a fortune for this person. So I was happy with the money that was spent um, in, in terms of, yeah, you, you can't track it, but we got some result and it saved us time. And I was, I was happy with that really. I mean, that's the best I can wish for. I wouldn't spend thousands and thousands on marketing people, you know, just enough to give it a boost at the end. Again, I wouldn't spend thousands on a trailer, like a thousand bucks maximum, I think. But I do a lot of the getting all the artwork and everything in place myself, um, you know, to help them do that. And I wouldn't expect them to work for weeks for free. I mean, I'm talking about paying someone for a good solid day to make your trailer, right? Um, but you give them the material, you do a lot of the groundwork. I mean, in the end, it's like, yeah, like if you pay someone to do something that you could otherwise not, not do at all, then yeah. it would still be, you know, any like, yeah, it would still, still be really worth it. And, yeah. Um, the issue yeah. with that is always the quality aspect, right? So it's like, and I have a difficulty with letting go of things, which I know I could do a good job of myself. It's, it's difficult for me to let go of something, but when someone's clearly better, like a, a better artist, a better musician, a better trailer maker, a better marketer, I will mm -hmm. clearly pay them and be happy with that, but I might still give them guidance. And I also want to learn from them at the same time, because mm -hmm. then I can give better guidance next time. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Excellent advice. I think. Um, so I want to kind of, uh, start, start wrapping things up here. Like we've been talking for a while. It's been really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe like you can give, um, an old, like what, what, if you were starting again today, <laughs> becoming an indie developer, but still knowing what you know now, you know, what would be like the most important like piece of advice you would get if, if that's possible? Hmm. Well, I think I've mentioned already it's difficult for new indies because if you don't have an existing audience and fans, that's difficult. The other thing I have is industry connections. Just because I've been around so long, I've met enough people that I can talk to people and maybe get funding or help or advice. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> And that's very difficult for, for new indies. Um, I mean, the first thing I would, I think a lot of people come up with the same advice, which is make games in your spare time. So like you should have another job or income or partner paying or parents paying or whatever the situation is. So you can make games in your spare time and get good at that. And I actually mean um, also complete games. So not just bits of games, but finish a whole game in your spare time. Now, it could be a game jam game that you spend 20, 48 hours on, right? That's fine. I've done lots of game jams. Then it might be a couple of weeks long for a game, a bit bigger, a bit more to it. And then you learn a lot more. And then you ship that game on something like itch.io or whatever, right? Um, and then you spend more time on a bigger game, maybe a few months. Maybe that game you feel was finally worth trying to put on Steam. This is all still in your spare time. Maybe you've worked with friends on the art or, or you're giving someone a rev share or you have paid out of your own pocket, hopefully, someone to, to, to make something. Or, or you've used assets, like you said. But it's just make gradually, like, like do, the domino, that domino meme, you know, small domino, slightly bigger domino. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're doing all that in your own spare time to check you've got the technical capabilities, you enjoy the process, you learn from the process. Um, you need to do all of that for quite a while before you would even dare go full time and make your own game using your own money and take your own risks, because that is a whole different thing, um, you know, and possibly results in failure for the first few games, you know, until you learn the ropes. But knowing what I know now, I mean, I would look at the market carefully. I would look, look at the platform. I'm looking at Steam. I would look at what is selling on there and not selling, the quality of those games, what's good about them, what's bad about them. 
I would get enough budget to pay for decent art, sound, you know, marketing, or perhaps get funding in. Because if you can make a prototype that's good enough, you can hopefully get funding for that, right? So that reduces your budget, um, you know, and then try try that and then learn from it and then make, hopefully make another game in the same genre, but improved, you know, unless yeah. it was a complete disaster, you know, then no, okay, change, change your plan. Yeah. Right? But if, if it's okay, but not amazing, improve on that. And then you can make better each time. Right. So I guess that's my advice. It was a bit rambling, but it's don't, don't jump in and be full-time indie before you know you've got the skills, capabilities, and you've got some idea, test, test the waters first and then, try to do a decent analysis, but enjoy the whole thing, right? Enjoy the whole thing. I mean, I spoke to people who are spending their own savings on a game and they're prepared for it to flop and they won't be happy. But if it does, they're like, okay, I can withstand this and I'll have learned a lot and had good time. That's okay too. That's fine yeah. too, you know? And there's still nothing wrong with making games as a hobby just for fun the whole time. I did it for 20 years, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. I think uh, I think uh, it was valuable advice. It's definitely practical, so that's always great. Mm. Um, yeah. So um, thanks so much for coming on. I think uh, people should wish this T minus thirty. Is that uh, your latest game, right? It is. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, that's uh, the yeah. city builder. Check that out. And um, yeah. Thank you very uh, much for coming on. You're welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me on. I think it's been a really good discussion, actually, and you've managed to. I've talked a lot, so I apologize about that. But you've teased out of me a lot of really good information, I think, that people can benefit from. Yeah, thank you. You provided a lot. Hey, guys. Mark here from Moon Knight Game Devs. Just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving a like or subscribing on whatever platform you're listening to. It really helps me out a lot. You know, it shows me that you guys like the content. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys have a great week.